This sermon was recorded at the Church of Christ Northwest Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 1708 Elm Springs Road in Springdale, Arkansas. It's good to be here with you this morning to worship. Good to see everybody that's come out. Uh, what I wanted to speak to you on this morning is something that, uh, that affects us all to some extent, and that's sins of our mind. And specifically, I want to touch on some of those things that, that we can commit these sins and nobody ever knows it. The, the sin is entirely in our mind. Oftentimes, we never, uh, it never affects us uh, or we never show it in any other way. Sometimes we do. Sometimes it leads us to actions, other sinful actions. But oftentimes, we commit sin entirely in our minds and it stays there. And it's a very dangerous thing, and, and again, I think it's something that probably affects all of us to some extent. Some of us have more trouble than others. But you know, when we consider it, uh, our mind, our thoughts define who we are, make up who we are. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. So as we think in our heart, so are we. The things that we think, what we uh, think in our minds, that defines who we are. And likewise, in Proverbs 12, verse 5, it says, The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. The thoughts of the righteous are right. Now think about that. Let's kind of flip that around a little bit. Why is a person right? Because their thoughts are righteous, right? It defines who they are. When we have righteous thoughts, that makes us right. When we have the right thoughts, it makes us righteous. And again, there's, uh, when we consider the, the sins of our mind, uh, oftentimes it's, uh, it becomes secret sin, sin that others don't see, uh, they don't realize, and, and that's what makes it so dangerous. And I think that's why we need to be careful and guard against those things. In Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul here uh, teaching on the Spirit and how to live in the Spirit. Uh, Romans 8, verse 6, he says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we need to focus on the things, the spiritual things, to make sure that our mind and our thoughts are on these spiritual matters and not just on the carnal things. And we see an example in Romans chapter 1. I know I'm rushing through these. I want to throw all this out here. Uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, here Paul's telling about the sinfulness of the Gentiles, the fall uh, of mankind and, and the, the downward spiral that mankind has when they begin in living a life of sin. And in Romans 1 21, he says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Okay, that phrase, vain in their imaginations, what vain means is wicked in this, in this usage here. And their imaginations, it's not like we think of uh, imaginations, of fairy tales and that sort of thing, but what that literally means is their considerations or their purpose. And so Paul says that they became, uh, when they glorified not God, they didn't glorify Him, weren't thankful for what God had done, it says, but... They became wicked in their purpose, wicked in their considerations. And then you can go on down through Romans chapter 1 and read all these evil things that they begin to do. And it really started here with their intentions, their purpose, their considerations. They became wicked, and then all these evil things followed. So it's very important that we control our minds. Uh, we understand that we must be spiritually minded. And, and again, to avoid those secret sins. Now, uh, I want to go through uh, just a variety of sins of the mind. Uh, and this is not going to be in any way a complete list. But it's what I've come up with. And, and here on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Christ speaks of this. Uh, he speaks about these sins that start in the heart, start in the mind. Uh, and, and what he's doing here, a lot of what Christ was doing, you know, the Jews had the, the law, and the law was a very physical thing, the law of Moses. 
And the Jews were pretty good about keeping that law physically. But the spiritual part of it and, and the reasoning behind it and the intentions behind it, they weren't quite as good at sometimes or they missed the purpose behind it. And that's one of the things that Christ was correcting them on here. Matthew chapter 5 starting at verse 21. He says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So what Christ is saying here is, is he's making this comparison. He's saying, okay, yeah, you know not to kill. And if you kill, you're going to be in danger of the judgment. Now, I believe what he's speaking there when he says in danger of the judgment, he, he means you're going to be liable to the judgment that the law of Moses had put in place. Now, you can read in Numbers 35 and Deuteronomy 16, you can see where uh, under the law of Moses, they were to, to appoint these judges in each city and when somebody, uh, when a man killed another man, they were to come before the judge and the judges would determine if it was what we would call manslaughter or if it was murder, as in a premeditated intentional murder or if it was accidental, okay? And so he's saying that uh, that's what you've heard. If you kill, you're liable to that judgment, okay? But Christ is going further with that. He says, if you're angry, angry with your brother without a cause, he says, you're in danger or you're liable to that same sort of judgment. And then he goes on, Who shall, whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. That would be like the Sanhedrin. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So we, we see this progression that this anger towards our brother without a cause can, can go through. We're angry within our own hearts, within our own minds. And Christ is saying here, look, that's, that's really no different than be angry, being angry enough to kill them. And of course, it, it doesn't often lead to that point, but Christ is saying that's just as bad to be that kind of angry, that kind of, um, have that kind of hatred toward your brother it's just as bad as actually killing them. That's what he's saying here. And so we must be uh, careful about that, that sort of thing. You know, God can see our minds. He sees in our hearts. He knows our, our motives. And, and we need to keep those things in, under control. Now, we may be angry with our brother, and we may never let it show. We may not let it uh, develop outside of our mind, but it's still there. And that's what Christ is warning us about. Further on in the chapter, Matthew 5, verse 27, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now again, we see a, a similar instance. He said, you know, the old law says don't commit adultery. That was easy enough easy enough to understand, right? But he takes it further, looking into the mind, into the heart, and saying, look, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed that adultery. It doesn't matter if you went through the physical act or not. If you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Again, God can see right through us. He knows our intentions. And that adultery that takes place may never come in the form of anything physical it's all right here in our minds and again that's why it's so dangerous for us and that's why it's uh, so essential that we judge ourselves and look within ourselves and make sure that we're not committing some of these sins like that because nobody else is going to see it nobody else is going to know it if we have these kind of things in our mind yet it's still sin just the same as if we commit the physical acts that's what Christ is teaching here now again, Matthew chapter 15, uh, starting at verse 19. Uh, this is, again, Christ speaking here. And if you'll remember, this is when, uh, uh, when the scribes and Pharisees 
ask Christ, they say, well, why is it that your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat? And he meant that very physically. They, it was a tradition of the elders that you washed your hands before you took of a meal. Uh, they practiced that. They taught that. Uh, they bound that. And so they're asking Christ, well, why don't, your, uh, why don't your disciples do this sort of thing after the tradition of the elders? And so Christ uses this to teach them this lesson. In Matthew 15, verse 19, he says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So Christ just uses that, and he says, look, you can wash your hands if you want before you eat. That's fine. But he said, that's not going to defile you if you don't wash your hands. He said, what defiles, he said, is what comes out of the heart. Out of the heart perceive evil thoughts. That's what's going to defile a man, right? We already read where the thoughts of the righteous are right. But again, if we have evil thoughts, then what are we? We're committing evil. We're committing sin. And that's what Christ is teaching them here. In Proverbs 6 and 18, uh, if you're familiar with this chapter, it's uh, just prior to this, he says, we're told there's six things the Lord hates, yea, the seventh, uh, seven are an abomination unto him. And one of those things, Proverbs 6, 18, is a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. And again, that imaginations means intentions or plans or a plot. So the Lord really hates when we have wicked intentions or wicked plans, a wicked plot, when we uh, devise these things in our mind that are wicked. That's what we're told here. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, you know, sometimes I have these evil things come into my mind that pop into my mind. And unfortunately, we probably all have that to some extent and and the reality is oftentimes not always uh, but oftentimes it comes from our past uh, whether it's intentional or not you know we we see things we hear things maybe we've done things that are not righteous that are not right and you know when you it's why it's so important for us to try to stay uh, to be very vigilant about what we consume what we see, what we hear, because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you hear it, it's hard to unhear it. You, you, it's just in there. And sometimes those things pop back into our minds, right? Uh, whatever it is, it can be any evil thing. And so it's difficult to get rid of them. And, and so you may be thinking, well, what about when that happens? What about when some bad image pops into my head that I saw 20 years ago? You know, some sinful thing. Okay, it happens. The key to that is not, uh, is trying to push that back out of our minds, to not uh, seize on that, to not hold that and, and to dwell on it and think about it. That's the whole key. Now look at James chapter 1, verse 15. He tells us, he says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. He says, When lust hath conceived. That word conceived means to seize or to arrest or to capture. He's saying when this lust or this whatever it is in our minds, when that's captured us, when it arrests our heart, when it seizes our heart, seizes our mind, that's when it brings forth sin. And that's what we've got to fight. You know, these, we may even see some, it may not be anything, uh, wrong that we've done we may see a billboard or hear something see somebody whatever it is totally innocent to us but that causes these bad thoughts these evil things in our mind the key for us is not to seize on those things not to let that capture our mind and to dwell on those things and give place for that that's the key to it that's what we must work to do now, another sin that we uh, may be guilty of, may not, is thinking evil of others, thinking evil thoughts about others, especially those in the church. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 2, starting at verse 2, 
Paul writing here to Timothy, he says, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but, do rather, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, and so on. Now there's two things in there, two words, two sins I want to uh, address specifically, the first one being envy. Okay, that word envy means ill will or jealousy. So when we envy someone, basically what we're doing is we're seeing something about them maybe possessions they have, talents they have, whatever it is. We see something about them that we like. And instead of saying, okay, my brother's got this, my sister's got this, or they're, you know, they've got this ability or whatever, instead of being proud for them, being happy for them, congratulating them, it produces envy. It produces ill will, a jealousy within us. Why? because somebody else has something good. And that's not good. That's not, that's not a righteous thing. We should be happy for that person, not jealous, not hating that person because look what they have and I don't, but rather saying it's good for them to have that. I like that. I'm glad they have that. That's envy. And that can, uh, that can be a big problem for some people. I've, I fell victim to that myself. I'll admit it. Another one is this evil surmisings. I don't know if you've ever studied this. Evil surmisings, that word surmising means suspicion, an evil suspicion of somebody. Now let's, for this, I just use this example, and I use this from, uh, shamefully enough, from, from experience. You know, maybe we, uh, maybe we have a brother or sister and they say something to us, brother and sister in Christ, or it could be anybody. I'll just use an example of one in the church. Um, we have a brother or sister, and, and they say something to us. Maybe we don't understand what it is, or it doesn't make much sense, or maybe it was a little mean in some way. But then we get to thinking about it later. We, we get to surmising. We have this suspicion. What did they mean by that? You know, I think they meant something pretty rotten. And it kind of makes us mad. And so the more mad we get, uh, the more we think, well, I don't, I don't, think, they like, I don't think they like me. And, and it starts this progression sometimes. And I haven't taken it this far. Some people have. That every little thing they do from then on, we're, we're suspicious about it. And we think, well, they don't like me. Look at, look at what he said. Look at what she said. Look at what they did. And it goes on and on, and before long, we're telling others, hey, they don't like me. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they said, and we're nitpicking them, and we're, we're tearing that person down, and we're speaking evil of them, maybe. Maybe that leads us to speak evil to other people about them. And where did this all start at? All of this that, that eventually can, can bust up a relationship, can tear up the church, can do all kinds of bad things. And where did it start? It started in our minds. It started with this evil surmising of, well, I think they may have done that. I think they may have meant that. And you can see the progression that, that's just a downward spiral. And it all started right up here. There may be something to it, but there's probably not. And uh, remember when... Um, the six things the Lord hates, yea, the seven are an abomination. That seventh thing he mentions is those that, uh, uh, though that, those that <coughs> sow discourse among the brethren. Okay, so God really hates it when we go around talking bad about other brethren and, and sowing these seeds of discord. But these evil surmisings oftentimes lead to something like that. And it all starts in our mind. And that's very, uh, a very dangerous thing. Now, with that said, I want to do a contrast here. 
You know, sometimes we, we know that we're not supposed to speak evil of others. Uh, we're supposed to be fair about everything and, and uh, not go around trash talking people. We know that, okay? But at the same time, we do have an obligation to warn others about evil around us. And I'm going to use this as a contrast to this evil surmisings. Look at 2 Timothy 4, chapter, or excuse me, verse 14 and 15. This again is Paul uh, teaching Timothy. And as was the custom, you know, Paul would go around, he would travel around and uh, teach in the cities. And then often uh, other men would come behind him and continue on there. And Timothy was one of these men. And look what he tells him. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, Verse 14 says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So what is Paul telling him here? We don't know much about this Alexander the coppersmith. I know there's been a lot of uh, thoughts on who he was and uh, what he had done. We really don't know much except what Paul's telling it telling us here he said he did me much evil and notice this he says the Lord reward him according to his works so he's saying you know the Lord's going to take care of this deal but he says beware of him he tells Timothy beware of this guy he says for he hath greatly withstood our words this is something that actually happened this is something that Alexander had done or a, uh, it was probably a lot of things Alexander had done to Paul, greatly withstood his words. Basically, he was against the church. He was fighting against Paul. And Paul knew that Timothy was going to be there. And so he's warning him. This was not an evil surmising on the part of Paul. This wasn't just all in his head. He saw this man. This man had done these evil things, and he's warning Timothy about it. And that's okay. It's okay for us to do the same thing but again, it wasn't just all in Paul's head because he didn't like this guy. That's the difference in it, right? Christ uh, warned us, warned his disciples about many people. Matthew 16, starting at verse 5, says, And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which, when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not, do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye did not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And I believe it's in Mark's account where uh, he uses the term Herod in there. He says beware of the leaven of Herod as well. But... We can see here that Christ was warning his disciples uh, of these doctrines. Uh, he was warning them about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and how they would lead them astray. Now, the Pharisees were a very legalistic, hypocritical group of people. Again, they just looked at the law and, and, and did the very legalistic part of it, but their heart wasn't in it, right? They were very hypocritical about what they did. They didn't love their brother the way they were supposed to. They didn't have the love of God that they were supposed to. The Sadducees, uh, there was a lot of unbelief with the Sadducees. They were very physical, worldly-minded. They didn't believe in the res resurrection, didn't believe in the spiritual things. And so Christ is just warning them here, say, look, you, you watch out for these people. They'll lead you astray, okay? It's okay for us to, to warn others, and we have a duty to our brothers and sisters to warn them about things like this. Uh, I just wanted to throw that in there and make the contrast that that's not evil surmisings. That's not sowing seeds of discord among the brethren. That's warning somebody about a very uh, real danger. Now the next sinful 
thing that we can have within our minds that I want to discuss uh, is worrying, anxiety. And uh, this is something that, again, I, I would say most people have had to deal with to some extent at some time. And before I get started on this, I, I, often my sermons come with a disclaimer somewhere in them. This is the disclaimer in this particular sermon. Now, there are times, uh, I don't know if you've known anyone in this situation or not, but there are times when, when there's a mental illness, some sort of mental disability or whatever, uh, that causes people to be very anxious. And that's something that, that uh, is very real, it's very serious, sometimes it's very extreme. And sometimes it takes different types of therapies, maybe even medicine of some sort. That's not what I'm talking about here, okay? I'm not just poking it, uh, fun at people or, or, or coming down hard on people that have something like that. What I'm talking about is God's people, in a general sense, we're called to not be anxious. We're called to not worry about things of this world. That's what God teaches us. Look at Philippians 4 verse 6. We're told, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That word careful there, he says, be careful for nothing. That, that word careful uh, is actually, it's, it's Strong's chap, or, uh, verse, excuse me, Strong's word number 3309, and what that means is to be anxious about. Anxious, anxiety is a better translation than careful here. So he's telling us to not be anxious about anything. And to be anxious is when we're overly worried about something, something in the future, something oftentimes we don't even have control over is the... Uh, that's the irony of the whole thing is oftentimes we're so worried about something that we can't even control it. But this worry, this anxiety can do several things to us. Uh, it can cause physical problems. You know, it can get so bad that um, people have ulcers from it. Uh, they have heart trouble because they're so anxious, so uptight, uh, high blood pressure, all these physical things that it causes. It can cause a person to neglect their duties when we're worried about something uh, that may or may not be coming in the future. We're not taking care of the things of the day, right? We're not taking care of our family or our work or studying the scriptures or teaching others or whatever it is. If we're focused on those things out in the future, we're not taking care of things today. And the third, and this is probably the most important, is we're not trusting in God. If we're just looking to things of this world and, and, and things that may not even come to pass, we're not trusting God to take care of us through those things. And that's what God wants. God wants us to lean on Him and to, to gain comfort from Him no matter what's coming. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that bad things won't come. It doesn't mean that it's going to be clear sailing from here on out because we're faithful and, and we're not anxious about anything. But what it means is that whatever comes our way, we're, gonna, we're just going to put it in God's hands and say, you take care of it and I'll ride through it. Just help me through this deal. That's what God wants out of us. In Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25, that's really what Christ is teaching here. Again, this is on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 25, he starts out with the word therefore. Okay, anytime we see that uh, therefore, what he's doing is he's, he's drawing a conclusion from the previous thoughts, and that's very important. And in this uh, group of scriptures, it's, it is very important to understand it, uh, to understand the context in order to understand what we're about to read. I'm not going to read back, but uh, previously in the chapter, in Matthew 6, what Christ has been talking about is to not lay up treasures on earth, but to lay up your treasures in heaven. And if you remember, he tells us that you cannot serve God and mammon, and mammon being basically an insatiable desire for wealth, looking at the things of this world and trying to get more. Okay? He says you're not going to serve God and serve that mammon at the same time. He says you're going to love one and hate the other. You're going to choose one or the other. With that in mind, 
he draws this conclusion. He says, therefore, this Matthew 6, starting at 25, he says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Now let me stop right there. He says, take no thought for your life. All of these different things, okay? What Christ is not telling us to do is to not ever consider what we're supposed to do, any of our duties, okay? You know, the farmer's supposed to plant for a harvest tomorrow. You know, as family, as a parents, we're to plan for our children's future. We're, we're to take thought for those things. That's not what he's speaking about here. That phrase, to take thought, is actually the same word, 3309, that was translated careful, that means anxious. That's the exact same word there. What he's saying is he says, do not be anxious for your life. Do not be anxious for these things. I wanted to point that out before we read the rest of these passages. He's saying, anytime he says take thought or take no thought, he's saying, don't be anxious. Don't have anxiety over these things. Keep that in mind as we read this. Matthew 6, we'll continue in verse 26. It says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which the, today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So again, when we look at that in context, when he's saying don't trust in treasures on earth, but lay up your treasures in heaven. And then he says, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, all of these things. And he even, he even gives us this question, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? You know what he's saying there? He's saying, how is being anxious going to do anything for you? How's that going to help you? If you're so worried about tomorrow, how's that actually going to help you? It's not. That's what he's teaching. He's saying, don't be anxious about these things. Verse 34, well, he says in 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added. Again, drawing that comparison uh, or that contrast, we either got to serve God or mammon. He's saying, you choose God. Choose God and everything will be all right. He says, take therefore no thought. He says, don't be anxious for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient is unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, we're not to, as we're living our life, what he's telling us here, there's enough things for us to take care of today. We've got duties to perform today. There's evil things that can happen today, and we've got to deal with them. He's saying don't borrow from tomorrow's evil things and bring them all on you and try to fix them today. You can't do that. It ain't going to work. You got to take care of what you got to take care of today. Wait till tomorrow and take care of those things. This problem of worrying, and, and I know there's a lot to worry about this day and age. Probably always has been, but it seems like the world's getting bad. Uh, you know, we really have it good, but it's, it's more the, the thought of what's coming. Things could get really bad, right? Well, we're not to worry about that. We're not to be foolish about it either, but we're not to have that kind of anxiety that we quit working, we quit focusing on the things that are important because we're worried about something that may or may not happen tomorrow. 
Again, this is things that can happen in our mind. Uh, nobody else may see it, but it can really affect us, and it can really affect our service to God, and especially in the sense that we're not trusting in God to carry us through those things, even if things do get bad. So when we consider these sins of our mind and, and uh, things that people may not see that, that may lead us to other sinful actions, well, what do we do about it? Well, it's easy to, to identify them, right? Well, we got to have a way to, uh, to solve this. James 1 and verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So you, from that, you can say, okay, we can't be double-minded. We've got to be focused solely on God, just as, as Christ taught in Matthew 6. Focus on the things of God, not on the things of the world. Not be worried about those things, but focus solely on God, not be double-minded. Later on, uh, in, in chapter 4, verse 8 of James, he writes, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse, ye, uh, cleanse your heart, uh, hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So we're supposed to draw an eye to God, uh, purifying our hearts, not be double-minded. And, <clears throat> you know, really it's, it comes down to just focusing on God and, and taking as much of His Word and getting as close to Him as we can and pushing all of those other things out. And, you know, Christ teaches this in a parable, Matthew 12, starting at verse 43. I believe this parable applies very much to what we're speaking about here. He says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell therein. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now Christ is speaking specifically, as he says, to a specific generation there. But I believe that parable uh, can teach us as well uh, in more of a general sense. Uh, you know, the image we're given here is this unclean spirit gone out of a man for whatever reason he's cast out the the man pushes him out whatever it is and he says he goes through dry places seeking rest findeth none so he says you know what i'm gonna go back where i came from when he comes back to where he came from he finds it empty swept and garnished it's even better than when he left it it's wide open for him so he take he goes back in takes seven other spirits more wicked than himself the last state's worse than the first right Okay, so how do we apply that, you know? Uh, whether we consider it when we first, let's just say when we first become Christians, uh, it's usually typical that we start flushing out those bad things, right? Those bad thoughts, those bad habits. All these bad things, we start pushing it out. And, and we're getting those evil spirits, so to speak, out of us, those evil actions, evil thoughts. Okay, uh, you might think of Simon the Sorcerer. He did that, right? If you're familiar with the story about Simon. But then Simon turned again, right? When he saw that, uh, that the gift of God was given by the apostles' hands, he tried to buy it. And it seemed like he was going back deeper than he was before. Not only was he going back into sorcery and wanting to deceive people, he was wanting to buy this from the apostles. And if you remember, Peter reduced, rebukes him real hard. Okay, when we push those out, the key is we've got to replace it with something good. And that's something, maybe a better illustration is with children. And it's, this is one uh, thing that I, I've struggled with, failed at at times, I'll admit. When we're raising children, uh, in order to train them up in the way that they should go. Not only do we have to get the bad things out, we got to get the good things in, right? You know, I get tickled, and, and probably some of our kids did it too, I don't know, but, but you'll hear parents, young parents with the little kids, they'll say, you know, they'll, oh, what's their first word going to be? Is it mama? Is it daddy? Is it whatever? It's usually no. It's 
It's almost, I don't know how many times the first word a kid learns is no. And the reason is because we tell them no about everything. No, don't touch that. No, don't go in there. No, don't say that. Don't do that. Don't. We tell them no their whole life, right? And we should. We got to get rid of those bad things. But sometimes where we fail is we don't give them the good things and fill their minds with the good things that they need, right? So if we tell them, you know, no, don't say that. Instead, you need to say this. No, don't act that way. Instead, act this way. Don't do this, do this. See, when we remove that evil spirit, so to speak, out of them, we've got to put the good back in. It's the same way with us. When we take those bad habits out, when we take those bad thoughts out of our mind, that's good. But we've got to fill our mind with something. We become just like the children. We're just like a wet sponge. We're going to soak up something. We've got to make sure it's the good things that we're soaking up, right? Philippians 4, starting at verse 6 again, we'll continue to read. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So Paul's telling them here, he's saying, you know, you've heard these things, you've seen us do them. Any of these things, it's good, true, pure, honest, of good report. These good things, these godly things, think on these things do these things you know it's not enough just to just to drive those evil spirits out of us because they may not stay out and unfortunately we see that sometimes in people we got to drive those evil thoughts out those evil things and then fill our mind with something good and that's really to me that's the whole key to the whole deal is once we keep filling our mind with these spiritual things and and get that uh, spiritual mindset uh, that makes it so much easier for us to avoid these sins of our mind and, and to avoid going down that road is to fill our minds with the good things as we drive the evil things out. Again, we don't need to be uh, excessively worried about things. We don't need to be speaking evil of others, thinking evil things of others. Uh, we, we for sure need to avoid these sins like fornication, or excuse me, adultery, committing adultery with our, within our hearts or hating our brothers. And we just got to be mindful of that because, again, it, to me, it's so easy for us to, to commit all these sins right here in our mind, and that's the only place they are. And that's why it's so dangerous. That's my lesson for this morning. I hope it's been beneficial. Uh, to anyone in need of our Lord, it, it's the custom here to offer invitation. Uh, if anybody needs the prayers of the church or needs to, be, needs to obey the gospel, uh, if you've been sufficiently taught, uh, we'll assist you in that. The brethren here will assist you in obeying the gospel. Or if you need the prayers of the church, whatever the need is, if you need our Lord, just come forward, have a seat on the front, let us know what you need as we stand and sing the song that's been selected. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. If there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, send us a message at facebook.com slash cfcnwa. To find more sermons, look for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and like our Facebook page. Thanks for listening, and God bless.